So we have a wonderful lineup this morning. Um, each panelist will speak for about 15 minutes each and then we'll open it up to a wider conversation. And together we will discuss environmental justice and indigenous cultures and reflect on a few themes that I think will really weave together some of the threads um, that we've heard and thought about and engaged with so far in this conference. Um, so connecting past, present, and the future together in our scholarship. Um, and also thinking about what can environmental justice learn from indigenous perspectives and methodologies. And then also the third component, which I'm really, really excited about, is how can we engage in meaningful work that's grounded in community, community practice? Um, how can we work together as collectives in this kind of environmental justice work that we're doing? So I'm really eager to hear more from each of the speakers, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, as they talk about their ethic of academic activism and uh, work that's grounded in community. And they've also prepared some really rich, uh, beautiful visual materials that they'll be sharing with us. Um, so first, I would like to welcome Kyle um, Powes White, who joins us, as you likely well know now, um, as one of our featured speakers on the uh, Sydney Ideas panel last night. Um, he joins us from Michigan State University. He holds the Timmick Chair in the Humanities at Michigan State University, where he's an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Community Sustainability, a faculty member of the Environmental Philosophy and Ethics Graduate Concentration, and a faculty affiliate of the American Indian Studies and Environmental Science and Policy Programs. His primary research addresses moral and political issues concerning climate policy and indigenous peoples and the ethics of cooperative relationships between indigenous peoples and climate science organizations. He is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and his articles have appeared in journals such as Climate Change, Sustainability Science, Environmental Justice, Hypatia, Ecological Processes, Synthes, Human Ecology, Journal of Global Ethics, American Journal of Bioethics, Journal of Agriculture and Environmental Ethics, Policy and Environment, and Ethics and the Environment. And I recently learned that he's also a fellow here at the University of Sydney, I believe, um, which everyone's really excited about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and also he convened a really wonderful um, conference on um, futures in the Anthropocene recently, which my graduate Decolonial Futures class was able to um, stream into, and we really, really appreciated that opportunity, so we're grateful to you for um, having organized that and, and letting us participate. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over and very much looking forward to your comments. <laughs> Morning. It's fantastic again to be here in your land and all the great Aboriginal folks and movements. Uh, here I was just uh, commenting last night just how awesome it is to uh, be in this land in this country because on the North American side we really admire the work that Indigenous folks are, are doing here and so it's always great to come here and, and connect with those folks and see, see what people are up to and, and learn and, and, and and hopefully engage in some exchange uh, uh, back. And so what I wanted to um, talk about here in the, the, the brief uh, time that I have is that one of the most um, powerful things moving forward in environmental justice for indigenous people is actually indigenous exchange. Uh, indigenous people sharing with each other about how we are designing models, ideas, theories of sustainability and resilience that we can use actually to drive our governance processes. And part of this is that we've really had to learn to step out of the typical policy mode and scholarship mode that we've been in for many years with environmental justice and start actually designing educational programs that uh, affect all generations of indigenous people in our tribal communities and that are actually used as the basis to get folks to actually design their own models, their own indigenous based models of sustainability and resilience. And so I wanted to share with you some of what um, this means, right? So for example, here's a Anishinaabe, so I'm Potawatomi, which is part of the larger Anishinaabe group. This is one of the models of uh, sustainability that's part of our culture, the seasonal round. And one of the interesting things about this model, right, is it's a governance system that doesn't have one government all year round. It actually is a governance system where the institutions of governance shift at least 13 different times uh, per year. 
and have numerous other institutional arrangements that are adaptive to the dynamics of ecosystems. Uh, my friend Shannon McNeely worked with uh, Koyakon in the Arctic and they created this seasonal model of their governance system. And what's really important about this is that it incorporates morality in different layers of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems into their very way of thinking about how to organize their society. Uh, this is a seasonal round from the Nez Perce tribe. You know, again, you see this idea that governance can be understood seasonally, and this really pushes back against what the United States and Canada have forced us into, where we had to adopt uh, government systems that uh, uh, reflected what the U.S. and Canada are like, which we know are not uh, sustainable systems. Uh, for the Umatilla tribe, they were trying to actually find a way to get women and girls involved again in their sustainability planning in the tribe. And so they created this model of thinking about the importance of the different foods that they eat. And so this was tied actually to a gender justice project. Um, uh, Kepa Morgan, that some of you know, developed this model to understand a very complicated notion of well-being for uh, Maori people called Mori. And tried to actually break down this notion of sustainability or well-being in certain quantitative terms as well to communicate to scientists, even though scientists won't fully understand what Mori means, um, but it's an attempt to reach out and to be diplomatic. And for a lot of Anishinaabe people too, we have these notions in our language that you can't really express in English. So a very common one is Bamadaziwan in the Anishinaabemowin language, which sometimes gets translated as the good life, but it actually is a word that refers to the state of being in a state of affairs of relationships where you know that the society is behind you enough that you can respond sufficiently to no matter what challenge you face. And so it's actually a concept of resilience and it's a social concept um, and it's one that refers to the, the, the good life. And so oftentimes people think about Bamata Ziwan they think about models like this. This is sturgeon life cycle, um, which is a traditional fish for many Anishinaabe people. And so we think in terms of Bamata Ziwan as all of our relations that are operating and working well. Um, this is from the Swinomish community. It's their health model designed by Jamie Donatuto and some of the elders and colleagues that she works with there. Um, and again, you'll see, right, that their kind of understanding of health includes everything from emotion to self-determination to community relationships to culture uh, to basic natural resource security. And so these notions of indigenous sustainability do not shy away um, from psychology and emotion um, as well as environmental outcomes. Uh, friends of mine, Tanya Wolfgram, uh, created this model of sort of sustainability and indigenous evaluation based on the actual sounds of Polynesian languages. And so it's based on the meaning of tones. And they actually use this to engage in health planning and self-determination planning. The Serpent River First Nation developed the Turtle Island Matrix, which they use to assess uh, pollution threats they face because they're in an area in Ontario that's called the Ring of Fire because there's so much uh, mining and other sources of pollution in the area and so it's all based in their uh, language and their concepts. This is from the American, higher, uh, American Indian Higher Education Consortium. It's a model of indigenous evaluation. <clears throat> this is from Linda Smith's work on, work on decolonizing methodology. It's a very complex notion of self-determination that includes everything from healing to transformation to decolonization and mobilization. And so I hope you see what I mean here, right? And there's hundreds of more uh, of these different models of indigenous resilience. And these are things that we create for ourselves, for our communities. And in my work, I oftentimes call this collective continuance because what I found is that the indigenous approach tries to understand what it means to be resilient through the lens of moral relationships, that it's moral relationships like accountability and trust and consent that are actually the basis of resilience and sustainability and actually are the basis for how we think about environmental outcomes, actually achieving environmental outcomes. So morality is one lens or one framework through which we can understand what it means to live in societies that can respond best to the changes that we face as people. And what's interesting to see in this work, right, is that a lot of indigenous models of resilience, even though they come out of our concepts and our conceptions of mathematics and uh, our relations to the environment, 
um, indigenous people have not shied away from trying to find ways to communicate these things quantitatively to scientists. So the Kepa Morgan's uh, Mori model then has this sort of way of communicating to scientists the nature of environmental risk using quantitative measures. The Turtle Island Matrix from the Serpent River First Nation, actually they've tried to model in quantitative terms um, what environmental risk is like to communicate out to proponents and to scientists. And again, these are not to suggest a one-to-one -one translation, um, but just the attempt actually to be diplomatic. Because as indigenous people, right, we're constantly being told that it's you know, us that need to accommodate uh, non-native people. Um, and the irony, of course, with that is one, we've accommodated them a whole lot. <laughs> um, but, but nonetheless, we're actually still trying to uh, find ways to reach out and communicate, uh, and oftentimes not given credit for that work. And so what I've found in working with a number of different indigenous people on these models of sustainability and resilience is that it's really an attempt to resist this idea that our history starts with Australian settlement or US settlement. Um, and that short period of history that we're oftentimes forced to have to squeeze ourselves into and so that we understand that uh, really our, our, our history started many, many uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years ago, we have a long history and this very brief period of disruption is one that's been particularly challenging. But if we open up our history and think of the legacy of our intellectual traditions, then we realize that we can deal with this current time as precisely what it is, a very short disruptive period and that we can draw on that legacy and strength um, of our ancestors uh, to actually resist that notion of time that seeks to squeeze us into uh, a couple of hundreds of years and for some tribes like just a hundred years. And so I've tried to create and be part of working with my tribal partners, uh, different educational programs to get young folks and folks who are older and elders to actually really work through what it would mean to create a model of sustainability for their tribal community that would drive their policy. And so I work a lot with the Sustainable Development Institute at the College of Menominee Nation, which is part of the Menominee tribe. And so the Menominees are, are over there. And actually they um, used to have a huge area of land, well over 10 million acres, but US colonialism reduced them to this little reservation. You can actually see their reservation from outer space because even though their seasonal lifestyle was ended instantly by US colonialism and domination, they reinvented themselves as a forestry tribe. And they not only created this commercial forestry that you can see from outer space, but they rekindled the idea that the forest is also a spiritual place, a place for kinship relations, a sacred place. And so you talk to many Menominee people today and they'll talk about how the forest is an economic asset for the tribe, but more importantly, the forest is their place where they engage in social and cultural activities. And so these stories are very inspiring. They even inspired white people. The Menominee Forest was one of the first sustainable yield forests, yet it's not based on a monocrop model of forestry. And so we have an indigenous planning summer institute there every summer for about 30 uh, tribal uh, college students and from all different tribes and if you've never been to Menominee they have one of the best powwow grounds ever it's called the Woodland Bowl and instead of sort of lecture and discussion what we learn about is how the Menominee sought to learn from their experience and they developed their own six-dimensional model of sustainability based on their kinship understanding of how moral relations are what got them through the nightmare of US colonialism and so using this model, which you can break out to engage in more complex types of uh, analysis for sustainability and resilience, we then spend all of our time uh, out in the forest um, learning exactly what it meant for the Menominee to be able to create this adaptation to colonialism and to survive in the face of challenges that few human societies would be able to uh, suffer. And so, you know, these are some of the pictures from the Planning Institute, and we learned about how the sawmill is actually designed to maximize employment, not to maximize profit. And one of the cool things, too, is we visit the nearby tribes and engage in actually comparative analysis of what different indigenous people are doing. So these are the Oneidas. They're a relocation tribe from what's now called New York or in Ontario. They're in Wisconsin next to Benominis. They built this school, which is actually in the shape of a turtle and the entire theme of the school has that, um, that sort of turtle shape and ambiance to it which is part of their history. 
They've cleaned up the land in their area, engaged in restoration. They have a food sovereignty program. They're engaged in all sorts of stuff for aquaponics, which is supposed to provide nutrition for elders. They've redesigned the actual urban infrastructure to reflect who they are. So when you drive through, you realize that you're in a different place. It's not the United States. And so these camps and programs, right, they're based on conversations, games, we have activities together. Uh, we do a little bit of the classroom stuff, but you can see it's uh, kind of just discussion based. We also invite folks from other indigenous traditions to share what they've learned uh, and, and their different models for resilience and sustainability. And we have great graduates that come out of this program capable of going back to their tribal communities and from the bottom up designing their own uh, models for indigenous sustainability and resilience that come out of their traditions. Another example I'll show you quickly before I, I close is the tribal climate camp. This was developed in response to this idea that tribal staff, tribal scientists of all ages are oftentimes you know, forced to adopt a certain model of thinking about environmental governance that comes from the US or Canada. We wanted to change that and say, well, if you took three or four people from a different tribe that were tasked with, say, working on climate change planning, and we did it at a tribe, an entirely indigenous context, no white people, um, what would we come up with? And so uh, we've done this uh, a couple of times now. It's going to be an ongoing thing. It's a partnership with the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians uh, and a few other uh, tribal and non-tribal entities. And so we're out in a tribal community. This is the Nez Perce tribe. And again, most of the activities are not based on lecture, they're based on games, you know, having a good time, people admiring my athletic prowess. Um, and we, the, the tribe that hosts us is in the Squally. Uh, we engage in a feast, we have incredible food um, and learn from, you know, what they're doing, have these discussions. And what's interesting is that uh, the, what actually comes out of the, the camp experience um, is that folks that typically are trained in science actually work together to say, look, if we're going to plan for climate change and resilience, how are we going to rekindle those models within our own tribes that will teach us about what we want from the landscape that we live in, right? What does the landscape mean to us and how do we need to plan for climate change in ways that allow us to support those uh, ways of, of life? That's me checking my text messages, um, right? It's all discussion based. <laughs> And so this is what actually people come up with, right? This is from the Nez Perce tribe. Um, and they use their traditional concepts of relationality actually as the basis for their climate change plan. A climate change plan actually, which is pretty uh, scientific, right? And other tribal teams, again, this is a basic drawing, a planning drawing, right, of what it is that the landscape ought to uh, be like. And this is the beginning of, 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 of working on climate change planning. And it all comes down again to understanding the landscape as full of moral relationships and having that long history, not that short history of settler disruption. And so I wanted to say miigwech and thanks to everybody for, for letting me share a little bit of these projects. I look forward to chatting with you all later. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you for opening up and um, for also starting off um, with the spirit of exchange. And I think um, that really sets a wonderful tone for uh, where I hope we can take this conversation um, further this morning. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Sean Cairns, who joins us from Australia National University. Um, and his research interests include community-based management, focus on natural resources, common property resources, um, property, common property resource institutions, political economy, wildlife utilization and development. Um, and prior to coming to ANU Center for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research, uh, where he is now, he managed the Northern Land Council's Caring for Country Unit, uh, which is based in Darwin, so has a lot of practical community-based experiences as well as his academic work. Um, and there he worked with Aboriginal traditional landowner groups in the tropical savannas of the Northern Territory, uh, developing land and sea management plans, enterprises based on wildlife utilization, brokering resources and training opportunities, community capacity, building and lobbying. Um, he also has a wealth of experience in sea rights issues um, and had worked for eight years as a senior policy advisor to the Te Ohu Kai Moana, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Commission in New Zealand, um, implementing the Treaty of Waitangi. 
uh, Settlement Act of 1992. Uh, He's also worked on uh, the People on Country, Healthy Landscapes and Indigenous Economic Futures Research Project, which I hope we can hear a little bit about today, and is currently working on the National Environmental Research Program uh, for the Northern Australian Hub. So again, has a lot of really rich, um, diverse uh, experience that's practically based in community. So please join me in welcoming Sean. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of this country, uh, the Gadigal people of the Uyuru Nation. So as a New Zealander, mihi mai karanga mai, mihi mai ki te tangata whenua to wahi nei o Port Hirini, um, uh, mihi mai ki ngā rangatira, uh, i ngā haunga mate, e haere, 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 nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. What I want to reflect on um, today is Indigenous peoples and climate justice, but try to situate my talk in the conference, so looking back and also looking into the future. And it's vitally important, as Kyle um, spoke about, of looking back to the past. For example, Māori people talk about the past as ngā rāo mua, so the days that lie in front of you, not behind you. So it's learning from the past. So when non-Indigenous people say, forget about all that colonialism stuff and just get on with it, it's impossible, and we get told that as young children, if we put our hands in the fire, you know, once bitten, twice shy. So we must learn from the past about how to navigate into the future. Um, and so I'll just start by um, just some images here, and just to remind everybody that in 1788, all of Australia was indigenous owned lands. 65,000 years of occupation, it was a managed landscape people and living in harsh landscapes where you and I would struggle to survive and predominantly using fire as the primary tool for land management and conservation. And also keep in mind that indigenous Australia is a complex place with many, many nations and peoples. So when people talk about Aboriginal culture, it's Aboriginal cultures, there's many cultures, many languages, and there's a diversity of knowledge right across this continent that's vital. Also, indigenous ontologies about seeing uh, nature. There's not a hyper-separation that non-indigenous people have, that the environment is a resource to use, to exploit, and to make money with, that people are in nature. And many Aboriginal people have the, the belief that their spirits come from the land, from the Jukapa, from the dreaming ancestors, and when they die, their, and their spirits will go back into the land. So the land and the people are one thing, similar to Māori, tangata whenua, people of the land. And we can't um, dismiss what happened uh, and the invasion. And as the Australian historian uh, Patrick Wolfe reminds us, that the invasion was not uh, a phenomenon from the distant past. The invasion is a structural event that is ongoing and Indigenous Australians are experiencing the invasion every day in their lives, and you'll see some of it come out in these slides. And these um, drawings are done by friends of mine who are now deceased from the 19, um, this was happening in the 19th century when the lands of the Garawa people were being cleared with guns, poison and intimidation. And the cultural wars in Australia, you're not allowed to talk about this. It seemed to be un-Australian un of talking about what went on. It's to here, the myth is of this, this uh, British settlement and the, the great uh, creation of the Australian state. But what we have to remember is that the, the um, development of the Australian state was based on the destruction of indigenous societies. And again, another painting by a friend of mine, Myra Rory, from the 1930s, clearing Aboriginal people off their lands and neck chains. This is the history of Australia. Indigenous Australians are incredibly resilient. So back in the 1960s, Yongu people sent these bark petitions to the Australian Parliament saying, white people, what are you talking about owning this country? We own this country, we have a system of law, and we've been here, you're invaders, we want you to recognise our country. And white Australians just couldn't get their head around this. And then Yongu people went to court in the early 1960s in the Gove land rights case when it was the missionaries who decided that the, um, the bauxite mine could go ahead. 
Aboriginal people tried to fight in the court to prove that they had a system of law and land ownership. And Justice Blackburn agreed with them, but the law was so restricted, he could not rule in their favor and dismiss their claim to native title rights. But that kicked off the land rights movement. And then Gadanji people at Wave Hill Station, who were being paid with tea blankets in the 1960s, and then started to argue for equal wages. Their, their right for um, being paid for their labor uh, morphed into a land right struggle. And there were many other struggles that were happening around Australia, the Pilbara strike in 1948, and in the cities as well. And what was vitally important in the struggle was non-Indigenous people like yourselves, voices in the streets talking about justice for Indigenous Australians. And this is the same way today that our voices are vital in the streets for the people of Manus. The refugees who are locked up at the moment need our voice. And there were some other wonderful people like Eddie Marbo here. Eddie Marbo, a Torres Strait Islander, a fantastic story, a gardener at James Cook University. When he was talking to Henry Reynolds about ownership of his land, Henry Reynolds, the historian, said, no, Eddie, you don't own that land the Australian Crown does. And Eddie said, no way. He spent years and years and years trawling documents and then mounted a case with others and overturn the, the fiction of terra nullius, that Australia was an, a land owned by nobody. And the sad thing was that the Mabo decision was announced six months after Eddie's death. And one day, like Martin Luther King Day, Australia will have an Eddie Mabo Day. So what did all this fighting bring about? This fighting brought about land ownership. Slowly, slowly, there was the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in 1976 which is uh, the red area in the center there. It was the land the Europeans didn't want that was given back. And then the Aboriginal reserves in the north. And then native tidal lands that are marked in um, green. You have exclusive and non-exclusive lands and then indigenous land use agreements. Um, and indigenous land use agreements only give Aboriginal people a right to negotiate. It sounds good, but think of the power ratio between large mining companies and small groups of indigenous peoples. But vital, but what this map is showing is that indigenous people are slowly getting their rights back to their land. So it doesn't matter where you're going to work in Australia, you're going to work with indigenous peoples. You need to know how to work with indigenous peoples. And then in this map, we start mapping where the indigenous communities are living. And if I just jump back, and forward, you'll see many indigenous communities are on their own indigenous lands. Where do white Australians live? They try to live as close to New Zealand as possible. <laughs> on the east coast here. So what we're seeing is that it's two, basically two groups of peoples living. So Australia is an indigenous landscape. And what are Indigenous Australians doing to look after their country? When the land came back, the land came back in a trash state with hundreds of thousands of feral horses, camels, donkeys, cane toads, goats, invasive species of weeds that are increasing the fire intensities. Aboriginal people, when they got their land back, got no compensation for this, as happens in New Zealand. They were given their land back, and then the white fellas pat themselves on the back and said, haven't we done a great job in terms of justice? Indigenous people are struggling to manage this land, and what they're doing are doing managing the ecosystems, ecosystem services that we all benefit from living in the cities, from these things that Indigenous Australians are doing, but they're doing it on the smell of an oily rag, um, often on unemployment money to be able to do this. It's also looking after the environment, but creating work for people who have never had work in their life. And what they're doing is they're drawing on a reservoir of their cultural knowledge. All of the things that this government says is problematic and is in the way of development, customary law, kinship, ecological knowledge is all vital for managing the Australian landscape. People are involved in, in um, uh, traditional burning practices again and, and are able, some are able to in, engage in carbon trading. But when Tony Abbott said that, Tony, that um, uh, climate change was all uh, possibly said bullshit, it, it sort of smashed the market for indigenous people to be able to live on their country, use their knowledge and make a living. People are also engaged in uh, uh, um, uh, monitoring uh, mammals, the disappearance of mammals. And it's their knowledge that's vital of knowing where these animals live and starting to document them. 
Indigenous people are getting access for the first time to new technologies where they're being included as an equal in these scientific processes. Many women are involved in the Caring for Country project. Children are out on country. There's always OH&S issues, no children on country, uh, where there's fire, etc. But how do you learn if you're not out on country? Um, these discarded ghost nets that are floating around the northern shores of Australia, killing thousands of turtle and dugong. It's Aboriginal people that are out there cleaning up the detritus of Western development. But why they're doing all of this fantastic work, the government is trying to still starve people off their lands, saying living on a homeland is a lifestyle choice. Um, you've got to um, move off, and they're starting to cut funding to outstation uh, schools, uh, health services, and trying to uh, yard people up as ca like cattle, as Jackie Green has in this painting. So it means that... Um, Indigenous people are being pushed off their country, that knowledge is starting to disappear. And also, the other challenges that they're facing is mining, this rampant mining that's going on in Australia um, and causing enormous damage to Indigenous peoples. And again, this painting by Garawa artist, cultural warrior and great friend of mine, Jackie Green, shows how he feels about what's happening as they're being pushed off their country by miners. And as he says here, in terms of fracking, you're fracking, you're bleeding our land, you're bleeding us, you're bleeding our ancestral beings. We are all of the same. And what it's doing is it has a deep hurt for people. People feel deep inside them that when you're cutting that country open, you're cutting me open. And Jack has a warning for us that if we're not careful, all of Australia is going to be dug up and sold and put in ships. So what his message is, and this is the thing that I always find so remarkable about Indigenous peoples that have such a history of violence from non-Indigenous people, is that they're so welcoming. They're saying to people, this is our land. We have to work together on this. It's only working together, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, that we can bring about a change and we have to create a dialogue, and their door is open. And I think that is just something that speaks volumes for the resilience of Indigenous Australians. And one thing that we all hope for in the future is that things will change, that Indigenous Australians will be able to make decisions about their own lives and their own countries, and will be not be imprisoned in the vast numbers that they are at the moment, and the assimilation project that is in full swing in this country will stop, and Indigenous peoples find their just place in the Australian democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. So thank you both for such moving and powerful and visually compelling presentations. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for our discussion period this morning. Um, so at this point, uh, we'll open up the floor um, to a couple of questions. Oh, and if you could just say your name and where you're from to introduce yourself when you ask your question, that would be much appreciated. Thank you both very much. Is that on? Yeah. Sorry, thanks both very much for that. Um, I'm Joanna from Peace Studies at Armadale UNE. I actually lived on Wave Hill Station in the 80s. Fascinating. Um, can you just, Sean, my questions to you, can you tell us how you see this dialogue occurring between the two groups? Uh, on, a, on a number of levels, um, at a local level where Indigenous people are trying to manage their country, often Indigenous communities have problems that they're trying to solve. It's important to empower them to solve their own problems, but often they need uh, relationships with outsiders in terms of grant funding or getting new ideas. As in Kyle's talk about exchanging knowledge between Indigenous groups, how can you help facilitate that of putting people in contact with each other, but also at a political level. Like in New Zealand, there's Māori in Parliament. There's about 28 Māori in the Parliament at the moment. There were reserve seats back in the 1860s. What this did was normalise Indigenous people in the democratic process. And here, the Indigenous Australians recently asked, 
after the Prime Minister said, what is it that you want? They said, we'd like a, a voice in the Parliament, and that was dismissed outright. So I think you, there's petitions going around at the moment, and I think it's vital that non-Indigenous people start putting pressure back on those politicians of saying, listen, open your ears, get that wax out. I'd like to thank you both for a really inspiring presentation. I was the one that woohooed in the back. My name's Freya. I'm coming from the University of South Australia. I'd like to note that universities are a problem. Um, my own university closed down our Indigenous Studies Centre. And so in looking at collaborations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous from the academic sphere, and I'm inspired to do this work, how do we change the university to move away from, and I'm going to put my uh, statement on the line, from tokenism or usurping things to actually coming to a space for uh, respectful, listening, um, inclusive conversations for a way forward. Because while we're doing this work, the universities are being corporatized um, and transformed in that process. Thank you both very much. Thanks for your question. Uh, one short response to that is that universities need to change and actually understand that what they ought to be doing is supporting the careers of tribal folks. In my own case, really, I don't want to be spending my career in a university, and many Native students I know it's the same way, but a university sucks you in and wants you to spend your entire career within the university, within the settler context, and they don't actually know anything about the fact that what we want to do oftentimes is have careers in our own right, in our own communities, moving up in leadership and responsibility within those tribal communities, within those nations and those intertribal organizations. And that's gonna require something that universities never do, which is a lot of service or servant leadership um, and a lot of background support. And so in my position, I do a lot of work to try to push my university and others I work with to do that and to show that you actually can measure the success, maybe not in a neoliberal model, and I know the situation here in Australia is different from the United States, uh, but we have been working to show that there are other types of metrics that can be used. Uh, yes, I'd agree in terms of the Australian universities. An example is New Zealand changed in the 1980s, and look at me, I'm a non-Indigenous person, I'm a Pākehā, I'm of Irish descent. Um, I did Indigenous studies, Māori studies, trained by anthropologists who were the natives who taught me not to look down, but to look up at the institutions of power. This was normalized for me in the academy, yet working in Australia, it's like I've gone back to the 1950s. And I'll hang the ANU out here now too, if they're listening. They have an indigenous studies program, 98%, 99% of the people who teach in it are white. And yet that is not seen to be a problem. And when you raise it, they look at their shoes and don't want to talk about it. So there's no engagement. And I think the universities are vital because you've got young minds where you can start planting ideas. And as Kyle says, it's vital that indigenous peoples are in the institutions and that the institutions start to change to accept other models and other ways of learning and stop being fixated on these journal articles that nobody's reading. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much um, to the great presenters uh, this morning. Um, my, my question um, is about the relevance of the indigenous knowledge uh, used for, for planning um, for sustainable uh, uh, development within the indigenous communities. I'm asking this because uh, from my experience in the, in the islands, there is a mismatch right now of the indigenous knowledge of the behavior of animals um, and also the flowering of some particular plants um, and the rising of some um, events um, and the arrival of the birds. So what is happening now uh, when the elders are telling the young ones, uh, when you see this flower go there, this fish will be there. But when the young ones go there, there it's, it's only a horse standing there. So um, I'm questioning the relevance in your planning for two reasons. One is that the young ones don't trust the knowledge from the elders anymore because 
and probably climate change is shifting uh, the ecosystem. And second is that the old ones are dying really, really young. So they are not having the moment to pass the knowledge and also to show the knowledge and to practice the knowledge. So right now we are reading it, we are reading it from thesis and books and journals, but we are not seeing it in practice. Thank you. Yeah, great question. The, the short answer to that is that uh, in my work, I've really tried to change people's perspective um, to move away from this idea that indigenous knowledge is only information. When you look at our indigenous knowledge systems, they're actually hardly about information. They're actually about the process of making a knowledge system accountable to the community. And so I really like the examples you gave. A lot of tribes that I work with in my own tribe are in that position. And what we argue for is that indigenous knowledge isn't about information or the loss of information, but it's actually about that idea that when we realize that somebody in their community might have lost their credibility, that it's our responsibility to rebuild the knowledge system by finding a way for that person to become credible again. Whether that means using science, right? Whether that means creating a completely different model of scientific research. And so a lot of tribes I work with, on the face of it, they do science in a way that looks like science in a university. But when you get into the details, the institutions that house the science and that support the science are very different. And for me, that's, for a lot of folks, the power of indigenous knowledge. I think indigenous knowledge is vital for the management of the Australian landscape, particularly looking at fire. Uh, the British settlers coming here, fire was a bad thing, something that you suppress. This is a fire-prone landscape. Eucalypts grow, and they have fire as an evolutionary strategy. That's why they drop their bark to burn all their neighbours out. So slowly, uh, scientists are starting to realise that indigenous people know about fire when fire should be lit how it behaves, uh, how the animals behave with it, and starting to employ that. Now, these things could be taught in schools, particularly in Northern Australia, not the story about Captain Cook and all of this crap, yet it's not, and schools aren't aren't teaching in language, there's no bicultural um, language policies, and we've got to keep in mind that indigenous knowledge is held in language. Yet when children are going to school and having to speak English at school and not their own languages is, is, a, is a colonial tool of assimilation. And again, it's sort of the erasure of indigenous knowledges. So I think that brings us to the end of our time for this first session this morning. So please uh, join me in thanking Kyle and Sean one more time. Thank you.